Well, good afternoon, citizens. What a pleasure to greet you once more at Al Monticello. But as you can readily see, uh, we have somewhat of a, um, a, a split canvas uh, <laughs> because we're welcoming through this modern uh, element of technology and the pursuit of science, uh, our good friend who has always been at the forefront thereupon, uh, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, who is with us now from Philadelphia. A uh, Good afternoon, Dr. Franklin. Good day, good afternoon to you, Thomas. Uh, well, I'm pleased to welcome you here, as are all of our guests. And before we begin to receive questions from our, our moderator, Ms. Alice Wagner, who is again with us to receive the questions of our friends. Uh, friends, will you allow both Dr. Franklin and myself to remove our masks? Well, thank you. We have their approval, Doctor. Good. Well, this will not be pretty, folks. <laughs> Here we are. Oh, Doctor, uh, as I've always known you. Uh, well, I believe, well, no, I, I suppose uh, you were much younger. I was I was uh, a bit older when, when we met. I believe by my count, Mr. Jefferson, that I'm, I must be something uh, approaching 37 years older than you or something like that, as I, as I was. Uh, very, very closely thereupon, dear doctor. When we met, in, in, when we met uh, for the Second Continental Congress, um, I, not, I was away for the first. Uh, I believe, and, and when I had uh, checked on that, that I was 70 years old, I knew that, but I believe you were something like 33 or something. Um, and something something approaching that um yes. so uh, you know we uh, so you'll forgive me by addressing you uh, less formally than mr jefferson uh, and i and I, I will call you thomas if that's all right with you sir uh, that's um, that's quite uh, quite fine by me doctor in fact you remind me that um, uh, my youth in your eyes uh, continued because uh, when we greeted one and the other again in Paris, uh, and I was so taken by your particular reception from the young ladies, <laughs> oh my heavens, continually besieged by oh, the well, ladies. And the old ladies uh, too. No, no, uh, no. Yes, but then when I asked you whether I can secede as well to such an attention, <laughs> do you remember what you said? Well, I said you were young. I refer to your youth in, in one way or another, sir. That's correct. You said you're still too young, Thomas. Well, you know, some things have to be earned, Thomas. <laughs> well, Doctor, shall we receive uh, the questions from our friends who have gathered to enjoy our conversation now? Oh, indeed. Let's do that. Well, Ms. Wagner, if you will, uh, we'd like to hear the first questions from our friends. Thank you. Dr. Franklin and Mr. Jefferson, can you tell us about the circumstances under which you first met and what were your impressions of one another? Oh, would you start with that, Mr. Jefferson? You seem to be jumping at that one. Well, I cannot forget my very first impression of you, doctor, because it was long before we met. Oh, indeed. I had known of, I had known of you, it seems, from the earliest days of my youth. Uh, when I had the privilege of an education, uh, both at the old, uh, old schoolhouse at Tuckahoe Plantation, later at the Reverend James Morris Classical Academy out here at Charlottesville, and then finally under the tutelage of Dr. William Small at the Old Royal College of William and Mary, your name remained the most consistent. And that is because of, well, the universal knowledge of your creativity, particularly in the field of electricity. Uh -huh. You were the foremost electrician across the globe, doctor, and always at the forefront of science. Myself so dedicated to that study, I read extensively upon what you had achieved. So I knew you before I met you there in Philadelphia, as you said, that spring, of 1775, the Second Continental Congress. Oh, indeed. Now, I, I suppose that you mentioned William and Mary. Now, I was there in 1756, I believe it was, and uh, you probably were not there then. Is that correct? 
That is correct, Doctor. You would have no, been a I'm rather not. young boy, I think, at that time. I was. At that time, I was uh, attending to the Latin school at Tuckahoe Plantation. But you had already become known uh, for that visit to the Old Royal College because I believe, was that not where the degree uh, of Doctor? Ah, yes. Yes. I, I, um, I never got past the, the second grade uh, in, in my formal education, and yet I received six uh, uh, honorary doctorates. Um, well, they called them honorary, but I earned them. You know, they were not for just building a building. They were for um, my achievements in, in science and such. Um, uh, but yes, and, and one of them I was, I was proud to say was, was William and Mary, and there was also um, um, Cambridge and Oxford and Harvard and uh, oh goodness, uh, what's that other one up there? Yale. Oh, I, I cannot forget Yale. Uh, my uh, my good friend, Doctor uh, uh, Doctor. Oh goodness, I, I I don't Reverend Stiles, Reverend Ezra Stiles uh, was the president then. Um, but yes, I uh, and I probably left one out. Oh, Saint Andrews, actually the first one in Scotland. Um, my beloved Scotland. I, I love that place, by the way. Um, but. Um, Anyway, yes, uh, it was uh, it was a pleasure meeting you. Uh, you were such an you were young. You were uh, you had already uh, accomplished much in in Virginia, and um, I, I was looking uh, forward to to seeing what else that you might be able to accomplish. And okay. then we, and then we stuck you with writing the declaration. I was too smart for that because I had been an editor, and I said I don't want to write anything that someone's going to chop up, and so I proceeded to chop up yours, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you were not the only one, Doctor. I'm afraid that I'm afraid that John Adams had a much heavier hand at it. Than well, he had a heavier hand than I in most but things. You know, as you're reflecting, as you're reflecting upon the the degrees that uh, have been gifted you. Uh, I remember when we first met in Philadelphia, officially there, uh, that I remarked that though I heard you had come to the Old Royal College of William and Mary. Uh, that I had attended only two years. And when we were reflecting upon degrees, you asked me uh, what degree I had received. And I lamented to inform you, I received no degree. A baccalaureate was not offered at the old Royal College at that time. Uh, so I, can you, you, uh, I can give you one of mine if, if you would like. <laughs> well, I've received some honorary and from <laughs> Yale as well. Oh, good. But no, I did not graduate either from a collegiate curriculum doctor. So what I find delightful is the fact that the two of us, uh, regardless of that, um, well, that default, if you will, in a formal education by degree, have both founded collegiate curriculums and universal curriculums. Yourself, the college uh, in Philadelphia, yes, and I indeed. myself working still on a University of Virginia. Very well. It's uh, uh, these things are so important, and one has to look toward the education of, of the future. You know, I start the the college I started uh, the the College of Philadelphia, which I'm told they now call the University of Pennsylvania. And in fact, I, I remember when it became a university, we started the first medical school in America there. But um, I wrote uh, that that a college ought to be that there. All of the other colleges at the time, including yours, uh, were sectarian. Um, involved with churches, I said, we need something that, first of all, a non-sectarian college, and also one that, that offers a, a, the option of a very practical curriculum, as well as just, uh, you know, we, most of these other institutions were turning out clergymen and lawyers, and I had nothing against either one, but I, I thought that architects and mathematicians and uh, 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 agricultural people and all sorts of people should have the access of, of an education like that. And particularly the two of us holding in kind a desire to see the continual pursuit of natural philosophy, in oh, other words, nice. the realms of scientific investigation. Are you a member of, uh, of our uh, Academy of Natural Science? Uh, I mean, the, uh, our, uh, uh, the, uh, oh goodness. Well, you know, you're told it's evolved into the American Philosophical Society. Yes, the American Philosophical Society. My memory is not what it used to be, sir. Well, you would have but, no uh, memory of that, dear you doctor. You know, I, I, I started, they say I started that, but actually the idea was one of our friend John Bartram, um, the uh, most eminent naturalist in America, so eminent that Linnaeus said he was one of the great naturalists of the world. 
Well, doctor, I'm happy. Are to we still answering that? Are we still answering that question? I don't know. Uh, I'm afraid we're enjoying I tend our to own ramble. ramble. I tend to ramble. I apologize. Well, myself as well. But had we not <laughs> passed many, many, many a happy hour. <laughs> And I'm so delighted to engage this once again. Uh, Ms. Wagner, we beg your pardon, but um, the next question from our friends. That's quite all right, gentlemen. Dr. Franklin, you had a significant role for two decades in presenting the concerns of the colonies before Parliament, uh, including advocating for the repeal of the Stamp Act. Indeed. Can you tell us how the status of the American colonies relative to the mother country changed in those years? Oh, well, certainly. Um, I had, I had, I was sent to the, uh, to, to London by the colony of Pennsylvania to advocate for their interests. Later, I actually uh, was the agent for New Jersey and Georgia and uh, Massachusetts. But um, so um, I met many fine people in the in the, the British government, and for many years I was very optimistic about uh, about our possibilities. I, at that time, I. I did not, and most of us did not envision independence for for the American colonies. But merely, uh, I had written as early as the 1750s about um, uh, a, a wish for a bit more home rule uh, that that our decisions should be made not by Parliament and and not by and and rather by our our colonial legislatures. Indeed, I felt that it was. Uh, it was inherent in the British uh, Constitution that Parliament uh, did not control the colonies. Uh, and um, as as uh, I went on in in London more and more, my my frustration with uh, with with the uh, Parliament led me to uh, advocate that um, Pennsylvania they become a royal colony rather than a charter colony, as it originally had been under the Penn family. I, uh, but um, as you mentioned the Stamp Act, and I must admit that when the Stamp Act was first enacted, to, in order to, uh, as the British thought, to recoup their uh, expenses in defending us here in, in America, uh, it, it did not concern me so much. I thought, well, it was another tax. And, and, and I must confess that I had been in, in England uh, long enough that I perhaps lost... Uh, lost my uh, finger on the pulse of um, of the colonists. Uh, and I think this happens when one is uh, spending too much time away from one's constituency, if you will. Um, I, I rather enjoyed being being in London um, and uh, the meeting all the intellectuals of, of the Western world there. And and I, I think I underestimated the reaction of the uh, the colonists, and particularly in, in a few places, uh, to the Stamp Act. and. Uh, when it when I did uh, realize um, that that reaction, um, I began to advocate against the Stamp Act. In fact, I made a, a, a very uh, the longest uh, speech of my life. I've never been one for speeches. I made um, in in the Parliament uh, to uh, have the Stamp Act repealed, and it was successfully repealed. But my 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 time in London. I'm sorry, Mr. Jefferson. Go on. Well, no, no, I was just, uh, I wanted to, uh, to add to this that meanwhile, back in the colonies, uh, we could not help but hear of your extraordinary efforts to introduce, um, I believe it was known as the Albany Act, a, oh, yeah. a, a particular method to allow autonomy uh, in an American parliament. And I think that was based upon, was it not, the, the Iroquois Compact. Yes, the Albany Plan of Union, which uh, which I had uh, ad 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 uh, addressed um, uh, at an Albany conference, other word, other words, I think it was 1754. I first brought that up. Um, that would would unite the colonies, not in one organic way, but unite the colonies in in uh, matters of defense and uh, trade and such. Um, a loose confederation, if you will, uh, based on the, the Iroquois Confederation. Uh, uh, I, I, I think you know of the incident, uh, Mr. Jefferson, where one of the um, the Iroquois chiefs chiefs in trying to put the confederation together uh, made a very uh, visual uh, illustration of of the benefits of that. He took a stick and showed how he could just break that stick. Then he tied six sticks together and showed that he could not break them. And he said, "This will be the strength of our of our confederation." And so, um, I certainly felt like um, if I, I felt from very early on that I was a British 
citizen. I was proud of that, but I was not an Englishman. I was a British North American, and that was a very special, I called us a rising people. Uh, I thought that with, and I predicted population growth for uh, the American colonies, and, and I, I believe that it, it, it kept being very accurate. And I, I thought that we would be the center <laughs> of the British Empire eventually. Well, that did not happen. Uh, and so as, as politics changed there and all, I became increasingly frustrated and so much so that when I finally left in 1775, there was a warrant out for my, uh, uh, for my hanging, <laughs> if you will. Well, you were not the only one doctor with that warrant. Uh, I dare say in Virginia, Patrick Henry and myself already had quite the bounty on our heads. Mm. In Your fact, I was day. so concerned when I left that I made out another will <laughs> because I was going to be crossing the Atlantic with British warships and privateer ships. And I was for the first time in that whole conflict, I was concerned for my life. Mm. Ms. Wagner, your next question. Gentlemen, you were both appointed by John Hancock, president of the Continental Congress to the committee to draft a declaration of independence. Right. How did you work together to achieve the final draft of our nation's founding charter well, doctor, I remember decidedly it was you that uh, the four of us, uh, four others on the committee, uh, invited to uh, take up the pen first. It was you first. Oh, certainly. As I said, first of all, you were a fine writer, and we knew that you expressed yourself very well, and you were of a, a very uh, uh, favorable temperament, I thought, um, to to present uh, to present these things. Um, as, as I. I was an editor for many years, you know, I had a, a newspaper and um, I did not want to write the Declaration of Independence. I, 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 I think, again, I, deferring to your talents and also knowing that having been an editor, I did not, I did not want to be edited. <laughs> and I knew it would be. And uh, I, and then of course, more forcefully, Mr. Adams uh, did, uh, did take you gently to task on a few things. Um, my, my feeling about it was, um, there was so much you wanted to say, and I really understand that. But as an editor, I said, we, we, we must focus on a few things and make it strong. And you so eloquently, uh, you echoed some people like uh, John Locke and, and the, although you, you changed a, a bit of his, uh, of his wording and emphasis. And you, uh, you, I think you were influenced by uh, probably Mr. Mason's uh, uh, Virginia uh, Statement of Rights, uh, however that was expressed. So, um, yes, those were my feelings about it. And yet I wish you to know that that Dr. Franklin, more than anyone on that committee, and I dare say perhaps more than anyone that I had the advantage of in life as a mentor, that Dr. Franklin helped me to learn wordsmithing. <laughs> Very simply, rather than using 20, 25 words to just find a good 10, maybe 12 words that would make the statement the more profound and provocative. Uh, for instance, I remember the beginning of the second paragraph, uh, I wrote, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable yeah. that all are born free and independent. Oh, it was Dr. Franklin, it was you, sir. Yes. It said, let us cut to the quick, Mr. Jefferson, simply begin, we hold these truths to be Self-evident. That all men are created? Equal. Done. That is your beauty of that, words. Didn't that doctor. say pretty much the same thing, Mr. Jefferson? I, uh, it, it, um, but, uh, you know, um, I, I found as a writer, uh, and, and again, perhaps because I was writing in a, at, at times, um, well, as an editor, and, and, and as it's certainly in a more self-serving commercial vein, trying to sell my newspapers and with all sorts of different things, but but I found that economy of words, uh, you know, I, people will sort of begin to slumber a bit as uh, if you go on. Uh, and and uh, I think one of the greatest dangers for a writer is falling in love with one's own words. Um, you know, they, they are our children, but uh, it's it as much as we might think so. Sometimes editing is not killing our children. <laughs> <laughs> so very, very true. Well, doctor, no matter what we collaborated upon, those uh, five on the committee, uh, we had to push that further to our, our Congress. We had to give it to them, 
and then sit back and say we have no further uh, support because of, well, proper parliamentary procedure. Our work Indeed. was done. Indeed, our work was done. And uh, I, I believe that uh, I believe that it has probably stood the test of time, don't you, sir? I believe it has, Doctor. I'm happy to say, indeed, it has. And it has become universal and being the inspiration for, I'm told, what will be upwards of 250 declarations of independence for many political economies 200 years into the future. Did, were I... I don't believe that that was in my mind at the time. Um, uh, I, I was, I think, perhaps one who looked to the future uh, more than many of our contemporaries, but I certainly didn't look that far into the future, sir. Hmm. Ms. Wagner, your, your next question to Dr. Franklin and myself. Dr. Franklin, you mentioned your time as an editor and a writer. Hmm. One of our guests, Bridget, would like to know, if that time as a printer influenced your political career at all? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I suppose it, it influenced my political uh, career. Uh, it, it's, I, 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 my political career, it, it, it just specifically political, was pretty short-lived. Uh, uh, I, I served as uh, the clerk of the Pennsylvania Assembly while we were still colonies here, and then later I was uh, elected to the colonial legislature for two terms, although um, um, I uh, fell into disfavor, as anyone who stays long enough does, and uh, was relieved of those duties, and I'm grateful for that now. Um, but it, it certainly brought me into contact with, uh, with a lot of people. It, and it also made what it was more important to me uh, was that it really, being a printer from the age of 12, uh, when I started as an apprentice to my brother, um, was the most monumental and contributory part of my life to who to who I would become. Um, I everything it first of all it gave me access. I mentioned my limited uh, formal education uh, two years. Being a printer gave me access to oh I don't know uh, I, perhaps what one might call an information highway. I don't know if that if I may use that term but I was surrounded by books. I was printing books. I was publishing books. I was writing books. Uh, first of all, it, it, it gave me my education. Uh, that and the, the travel I, I, I engaged in later. It also made me enough money uh, that I could, uh, that the, the printing and the newspaper uh, more specifically, that I could engage, uh, I could leave my, my business uh, day-to-day -day business at the age of 42 um, and engage in, in the study of electricity um, specifically and other, uh, other studies, um, it, it, it gave me that. And, and I, I was able to make a pretty good living as a, as a newspaper publisher. Um, here's a, a scandalous note I'll interject. I was the, uh, the, the British uh, postmaster for the North American colonies, and this, they, they didn't pay me much, but I was given the franking privilege, which meant I could mail things free. And so I mailed my newspaper to every of the, one of the American colonies, and the, uh, the Pennsylvania Gazette became the largest circulation newspaper in America. I suspect they'd put me in jail for that now, but, but at that point, it was, it was legitimate. But um, the other thing I did, which uh, as a businessman, um, I, I managed to do what you would call franchising. I had taken, I had set up young men in printing shops all up and down the, the, the country. And uh, then when I, when I did retire from the day-to-day -day work, I, I took in a partner in my, my printing shop in Philadelphia and I would provide the equipment, the training and take a percentage of the profits for a number of years. And so I was able to continue to profit from my, my uh, printing business without going to the office every day. And, um, that also, uh, and so that led to the study of electricity and my published findings in that made me the most uh, well-known American in Europe, which led to my diplomatic career. I had no, no uh, education in, in diplomacy, um, uh, but that made me famous, as you, if you will, in, in London and, and Paris. And, and I would, so I was the one sent uh, to many of these people. I was the only American that they had heard of. So my printing business led to so many things in my life, such that if you ask me today, after all those things I've done, which we will talk about, what my occupation is, I will gladly say printer. 
Mr. Jefferson, after the victory of our American Revolution, you were commissioned by Congress to su succeed Dr. Franklin as ambassador to France. Chester would like to know, what did you learn about diplomacy from Dr. Franklin? Oh my, Dr. Franklin just said, you, you have all heard it, that he uh, had no particular, uh, shall we say, course or instruction in diplomacy. And yet in representation of our young nation, he was received not only at the court of Louis of France, but throughout all of the kingdoms of Europe as long the man, man in nature. You recall this, I, I well, know I, I, Modesty forbids, Mr. Jefferson. No, it, it was extraordinary. Duplessis even painted a most marvelous portrait of you, sir, with that heavy coat and the fur collar and a, a fur cap uh, as well. And its title was Loam, Man, Man in Nature. You know, you mentioned and, that you succeeded me, and I want to I want to uh, to give you a, a bit of a compliment, sir, because uh, I was not uh, present at this particular uh, conversation, but I, I did hear later that uh, someone asked you if you were there to replace Dr. Franklin, and you said uh, no one can replace Dr. Franklin. I am merely his successor, or something to that effect. And I thought that was the most gracious thing to say, and it says much about you, Thomas. Well, I, I can only tell you that uh, indeed I will always hold by it and so will many uh, into time that you cannot be replaced. And well, I can assure you that, uh, that when I first stepped foot on the soil of France, and by the way, I was beleaguered with a terrible seasickness. Mm. It remained with me for an entire year, if you recall, doctor. Uh, many questioned whether I could secede Dr. Franklin. Mm. I, I felt that I fell into a, well, a court of humility uh, of myself, most humble indeed, how I could possibly uh, sustain the most remarkable representation uh, of Dr. Franklin. And if you remember, Doctor, right after we voted on our Declaration of American Independence, uh, our new Congress of our nation there in Philadelphia actually commissioned the two of us, uh, yeah. yourself and me, to be co-ambassadors of our young nation at the Court of Lewis. I could not go. Uh, our new Commonwealth of Virginia required me to continue to work on the Constitution of Virginia. And you may remember how I was I so concerned about the health of of I, Mrs. Jefferson. I certainly do. And, and we all wished you very well in that and understood why you couldn't couldn't accompany us. It was Mr. Dean, Silas Dean of Connecticut, who, who went in my stead and, and accompanied Indeed. you. But sir, you are the one. You are the one who became renowned. Well, yes. Uh, and uh, you, you were the, I, I'd say, uh, a Virginian that I was happy to see there. Not so much uh, Mr. Lee, but uh, who I apparently tended to poison the Congress uh, uh, against uh, my efforts there, uh, writing back to his, his brothers. Um, but I suppose the less said about that, the better. Well, but doctor, every one of us uh, have had those, our, our nemesis, who are determined to, um, to uh, force us into arrears. Uh, as you know, <laughs> General Washington was caught in that Conway cabal. Oh, indeed. And, and yet what helps us to succeed, doctor, would you deny, is very simply character, good character. And when I heard you say that you brought so many in as apprentices to acquaint them with printing, to be able to engage the spread of enlightenment, well, doctor, doctor, the entire world has become your apprentice in the pursuit of enlightenment, in the pursuit of liberty, and in pursuit of what constitutes good character. I have to say this because for certain, uh, that humility that I encountered when I first arrived in France could only be assuaged by following in the footsteps of such great men as Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Well, you're much too kind, Mr. Jefferson, but I do appreciate that. In 1787, when the Constitutional Convention met in Paris, Dr. Franklin played a central role while Mr. Jefferson you were still in Paris. Mm. 
Can you tell us about some of your discussions about the framing of the Constitution? Well, Doctor, you were there. I was I, there, indeed. And but we were all uh, we were all supposed to keep uh, things a secret while we were there. Although I understand that Mr. Madison may have had some uh, correspondence with you about it. Is that correct? Can we talk about that? that? Is absolutely Jefferson? correct, yes. Doctor. Yes, uh, constant correspondence with with Mr. Madison and. Um, he, he continues, I may tell you, to enlighten me upon many, many different subjects. Uh, the most luminous mind I've ever known, save yours, sir. Uh, uh, well, certainly, certainly a most admirable man who uh, had a, a mind uh, uh, that, that was a wonderful mind and, uh, and a wonderful manner about him. He, he, was, uh, he was not the, an intrusive sort of person, but uh, you, you always knew what uh, what Mr. Madison was thinking, and and uh, it was uh, it was a wonderful thing. In fact, as I recall, um, when I, I understand that uh, you, you, I know your friends, I understand that that the uh, capital is uh, is it is determined that the capital will move from uh, Philadelphia um, to uh, to that swamp uh, somewhere uh, south of here. I, I believe that's partly in Virginia, is it not, sir? But uh, it is partly in Virginia, and it is partly in Maryland. We but have this is, you had a hand in determining that, as I recall. I, I did have a hand you in determining. You and Mr. Madison and Mr. Hamilton. We had to get our nation's new capital city out of the urban markets, as far removed from the association of counting houses as we possibly could. You remember at the Constitutional Convention, I certainly was not there. But General Hamilton was incessant in his idea that the new federal government under a constitution, a stronger, more central system of government. And remember, doctor, though 3,000 miles away, I still thought the Articles of Confederation were a venerable fabric. But well, it was. Venerable. I, I know many people who are venerable who should be retired, though, Mr. Jefferson. <laughs> but, sir, <laughs> sir, you know Hamilton's scheme was considered to be an amelioration uh, between the small states and the larger states. Yeah. And from what I remember in correspondence with Mr. Madison, that was the great concern of the Constitutional Convention. How would the smaller states continue uh, in association with larger states? The larger states would overwhelm them. I'm, 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 I suppose hearing what, what you say about the one of the reasons for moving it, I suppose I'm comforted to know that in the future, the the United States Capitol will not be influenced by markets or urban uh, affairs or or anything else. So it will continue to be in this quiet little country spot there. Is that correct, sir? Indeed, sir. Along uh, the <laughs> Potomac River, 100 miles removed from the ocean, uh, uh, near yeah. the, the, the rapids, if you will, the fall lines of the Great Potomac River. Aha. Uh -huh. And old General Washington will be happy, I'm sure. Very much so. It's contiguous to his, his great holdings uh, down there along the Potomac. And, sir, it is located uh, near two small towns, which I think you had visited, one being Georgetown, uh, there on the, the North Bank, and the other, Alexandria. Oh, yes, oh, wonderful Georgetown. towns. Now, now the um, speaking, though, of your your thoughts about the Constitution, I know we brought up, uh, I brought up, I guess, Mr. Hamilton, uh, I know that one thing that really concerned you was um, the the fact that uh, there was a potential for the executive to stay in office for uh, a considerable length of time and that you found that troubling. In fact, Mr. Hamilton, uh, I think just wanted to give us another king, <laughs> a president serving for life uh, uh, based on his good behavior. But uh, didn't you say something about uh, a fear of um, of having people who could just continue in office? Precisely, sir. It would be no different than the uh, the intrusions and the prerogatives of, of royalty and monarchy and nobility. In fact, it was about this time, doctor, if you remember, while you were still in France, uh, we had discussed uh, the continual uh, tyrannies that could result from allowing anyone in office over too long a period of time. Yes. And this was one of the reasons why in about 1786, you had been returned uh, to our nation uh, about a year, yes. that uh, I acquired for myself, in fact, I, I have it right here. 
I inquired for myself a, a, a seal, a watch seal, uh -huh. uh, upon which are my initials, a T, J, but then around the perimeter of the, uh, the seal, uh, your great statement, rebellion to tyrants is uh -huh. obedience to God. Remember that? Yes, indeed, I do. I do. And um, I, I think that uh, the potential have, of, ty of tyranny is always, is always present, no matter what system one has, I suppose. But uh, the, uh, I, I still believed um, that um, certainly while, while General Washington was, was with us, and, and as long as he will continue to be with us, I was not as concerned about uh, about tyranny and in, in the, certainly in that highest office, but um, but none of us will be around forever. And so uh, it is a concern. Well, doctor, I'm pleased to inform you that the general did not want to stand for a second term as our nation's chief magistrate. I had to visit him at Mount Vernon and convince him. Uh -huh. And yet after he did successfully stay on for another four years, he set a precedence a precedence of only eight years uh, in the office of the chief magistrate, and I was the first uh, to be able to follow it in kind. And doctor, when we speak of the first, I know enough of what I've heard of that constitutional convention that when it was discussed who ought to stand as the first president of our nation, the first chief magistrate under the constitution, you were the one that came up in conversation more than any other. Well, I, I believe. Uh, do I need to tell you why I why why that was not going to happen? I'd be happy to. I have several reasons. If you have enough time. Uh, <laughs> well, well, first of all, when General Washington took his oath of office, I was already eighty three years old uh, and uh, not in in the best of health. Um, I, I've never been an executive of anything. Uh, and uh, never wanted to start being an executive of anything. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and also everyone wanted General Washington. So um, th there are probably reasons I could go on and on with why, uh, why uh, it was never meant for me to be, uh, to be the, the chief executive of, of, of this country. Oh, you are most gracious, doctor. You are most gracious. Because... I was the president of Pennsylvania uh, briefly, but um, yes. Your next question, Ms. Wagner. Stephen would like to know the, uh, both of your thoughts on the institution of slavery. Well, doctor, as you well know, I am the one who continues uh, to oversee what cannot be denied as the most barbarous institution. A stain uh, upon America. I, did you not say that, sir? I did, sir, and, and how well you understand. Well, I, I am not. I am not guiltless myself in that regard. Not nearly on the scale that that you're talking, but uh, um, I, I, I am not guiltless. And and but continue, and I will, I will not let you take in the entire scorn on this one, sir. <laughs> well, I shall accept it, and I will tell you that history shall be harsh with me, and they have every right to be, uh, though trying to promote uh, a future emancipation of this practice. I. I am not succeeding. You said it was uh, like holding a wolf by its ears, I believe. Could you explain indeed, that? Roman writer Publius Sirius, who made that statement about the institution of slavery during his time uh, in the ancient world, that you hold justice in the one hand uh, while you hold in the other, uh, while you hold in your other, your, your livelihood. Uh, Doctor, we talked about slavery many, many times uh, when we were in Philadelphia, we first did. meeting in 1775. Uh, you yourself had already begun a, a slave emancipation society, even though, as you inferred earlier, uh, you you owned slaves. I did, and I never, I, I never, I, I suppose, I, I was never, I suppose, as invested in the institution, uh, uh, certainly, a, of, of, of the uh, livelihood uh, situation uh, as you, and, and I know you inherited that, sir, but um, it, it, you know what, let me, let me talk about slavery because I, again, I, I cannot, I cannot uh, sweep it under the rug and I do not choose to. Uh, I did hold uh, 
a, a, a few slaves, um, household slaves for some years. And um, I, I felt, I began to change. Uh, it, um, it was um, certainly uh, my uh, good friend, uh, Anthony Benize here in Philadelphia, who, um, who influenced me in, in this. And I was also um, influenced in, in London by, by Samuel Johnson who uh, exposed me to a, a school for young uh, Negro children, as, as we called them then. And um, I, I began to see both in, uh, in, in Mr. Johnson's instance and later in, in my own neighborhood in Mr. Benizet's school, that these children, when given the opportunity and the means to, to learn, were every bit as as intelligent and, and capable as, as the white children. And we had grown up, I know you did too, under the myth that these people were of a different, practically of a different species and not, and not the, the, the same sentient beings that, that, that we are. And so when I began to see that that, that, that was false, I could no longer consider holding people in, in bondage. It, it, it did not, it, it just would not work for me. And I honestly believe that what happens in that evolution of thought is that when one sees and accepts the fact that this is not property, these are human beings exactly like us, uh, only in different circumstances, one cannot justifiably continue to um, engage in, in holding people in bondage. Those are, th that is the evolution of my thought. And I did, did help to found the American philosophic or the, the American Anticipation uh, Society. I also wrote in my newspaper, uh, satirical uh, articles, um, uh, about, um, the, rid the ridiculous, um, thought of, of us holding slaves, uh, I reversed it at once. I wrote about a, a sultan and, and a, a potentate in the Far East who uh, uh, was holding um, uh, Englishmen in, in, in Americans in, in bondage and uh, seeing to, seeing how the other the other shoe would work. Uh, and then I later uh, in in my recent years, uh, despite the 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 agreement we made in the Constitution uh, to uh, not talk about the issue of slavery for 20 years, I did write a, a letter to Congress at the behest of the Quakers in Philadelphia to to uh, take up the uh, the the question of excuse me, of abolition. So um, those those have been my thoughts over the years in, 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 on slavery, sir. Uh, and Dr. Franklin, as uh, we have been speaking about the Constitutional Convention earlier, was it not one of the most remarkable compromises to realize, though bound by habit and custom and particular laws uh, of the time, and particularly that year of, of 17 and 87, and, and creating, if you will, the electoral system uh, for the office of the chief magistrate, uh, recognizing a balance between the smaller states and the larger states would be in creating uh, slavery three-fifths of an individual, which is an abomination without a question. That will give uh, you an, uh, that will give you an extra elector, I believe, sir. <laughs> no, but, but that but the point of the matter being that we realize our constitution is open to amendment, and though that might be. The yes. method at present uh, has been bound by generations of these customs and laws that it does not mean it must remain uh, the habit, custom, and law for the future. And our Constitution may be amended. That's the whole process. Is it certainly mine. is. And that, that How was, often you discuss a child of 14 cannot wear the same clothes at the age of 40. Our laws and institutions must grow as we grow as a people. And, and that is a deference to your enlightenment upon this subject to help construct a constitution that would grow as we grow as a people. Well, I felt that I was not of a mind to, to leave that convention without a constitution. Uh, I knew it would not be perfect. It could not possibly be perfect and have nine states uh, ratify it, sir. But I was heartened by the fact that there was uh, a process of amendment, and yet it was not something that we could just do every other day. Uh, it was not uh, the easiest process, but I, I had faith 
in that evolution of thought, in that evolution of, of, of just this American uh, character, if you will, that, uh, that it would be addressed. Else mm -hmm. I knew that, uh, you know, when you kick something down the road, you are going to trip over it when you get there. And I, I fear and feared then that uh, this issue would not go away. And uh, that given the vast differences about it, that there was every fear of, of, of just tearing this, this new nation apart. Hmm. Well, gentlemen, I'm afraid we are running out of time. Oh. If you could just share with us the last couple of thoughts about your hopes for the future of the nation. Oh, bye. Well, Dr. Franklin, if you will, my hopes and thoughts for the future of our nation are that so much of what you accomplished may continue to live on, that we will continue to be devoted to your sincere and deep attachment to the pursuit of science as a reconciliation for anything nature hurls against us that might be a well, that might be a detriment to our further pursuit of happiness and particularly the maintenance uh, of our health. That your interest to continue to pursue the enlightenment of the family of man, not only in our nation, but across the globe, uh, may continue a jealous attachment that, that our nation can be at the forefront of such universal enlightenment. And in particular, that your University of Pennsylvania will continue. The monies that you will devote to a, uh, an institution, say uh, a Franklin Institute, may continue to provide uh, an emporium where people can go and, uh, and realize what you have provided for the future happiness of mankind. That newspapers uh, will continue to inform inform man to be their own judges of what they read in the newspapers in order to have that knowledge and to to have that foundation of fact because as you well know the true competition of newspapers is which newspaper will have the fact first uh -huh. in order they might thereby provide the, the appropriate vote uh, for their representatives in the future i, I dare say ms Wagner, i could go on and on and on for my hopes to the future as vested in the great opportunity and friendship to know Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Thank you. And thank you, thank sir, you. for being with us today. And I, I, I would just like, it, may I, as always, sir, as always, you are the last word. May I just say my hopes for the future, sir, briefly. If, uh, I know you could go on and on, but uh, I just want to say that I will endorse everything you've said, Mr. Jefferson, and I will also add that I hope this country will continue to be what it has been for me, uh, the son of a candle maker with a limited formal education, um, the opportunity to become what one needs to become. Uh, I, I hope that is always there as it has been for me in this, this country, in this city of Philadelphia, um, the opportunity to find my, uh, my place in the world to create my place in the world, not simply to, to find it, but to create it. And, and I hope that everyone in this, in this new nation uh, will have the opportunity that I've had to, to, uh, to educate oneself and to uh, have the, the finest education that one can have and to, uh, to be a, a contributing uh, force in this country and to, to uh, to pursue the happiness that, that you described so eloquently in that document. And uh, thank you very much. It has been my sincere and, and deep pleasure to engage in this conversation with you, Thomas. My pleasure as well. Citizens, I thank for the opportunity that we have been able to welcome Dr. Franklin in our company today, particularly to thank Ms. Alice Wagner for being with us. Thank you. Uh, to engage your questions. Um, we look forward to visit with you again and rest you assured, Doctor, we remain, do we not, your humble and obedient servant. Indeed we do. Thank you.